speak, more than 330 officers normally assigned to non-enforcement roles are at the police academy getting trained for our summer all-out program. We're starting all-out a lot earlier this year. Those officers will be on the street by June 8th. Okay, you just heard from the NYPD chief of department, James O'Neill. Now, what he was talking about is how the department is preparing earlier for what could be a long, hot, and dangerous summer. Dangerous because if you look at the math, homicides are up compared to last year, just as, maybe coincidentally or not, stop and frisk stops are falling. Now, we all agree that that tactic is not always applied fairly, especially when it comes to minority communities. But the question is, is safety sometimes compromised when cops back off? And this isn't just a New York problem. Look at Baltimore, for example. We all saw what happened in the aftermath of the riots. Um, well, the city is seeing a huge spike in violent crime, just as arrests have plunged there. Not a simple question, but and I'll start with you, Andrew. But you heard the NYPD laying this out, and, and they're making it clear that Gun violence are up. It's not just gun violence against officers. It's gun violence across the board. We'll do a historical in a little bit, but just year to year, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, police tactics have changed. Presence has gone down in the community. Stop and frisk have gone down in the community. Um, and the violence has gone up and tied to guns every time. There's a debate within the administration right now if maybe they backed off too much on stop and frisk. I've always wondered how you can be half pregnant with this policy, but it seems that's what some people are advocating. Well, first of all, I think we should throw out the Baltimore comparison and all this, because Baltimore police basically just stopped making arrests after all the Freddie Gray stuff happened and after the, the riots. And, and that's what happens. I mean, it's, it's similar to the knucklehead stuff that the NYPD did in the couple of weeks following the death of the, of the two officers late last year. Uh, and fortunately, that only lasted for a couple of weeks. Is there a correlation between reducing stop and frisk and, and the increase in gun violence? There might be. It depends on the neighborhoods you're talking about. I'd like to see more targeted data to see if the, if the number of uh, gun incidents are correlating to the places where the stop and frisk have wound down. But we come back to the same trade-off that we were talking about the other day with the Patriot Act. It, yeah, you can frisk everybody who's walking down the street in New York City and get rid of all the guns, but at what cost? And I would argue that treating everybody as though they're already guilty of something is too high a price. You know, you just came from Patterson, right? Um, you could translate that to different cities. Where does the line, if you had to, I know it's not a science, Dominic, but where do you put the line when the community says, I don't like being uh, put up against the wall when I'm coming back from the store, but if it means keeping thug A, B, and C here from walking around indiscriminately in the community with a gun in his waistband, I'll take it. When does that line start to happen? Because people forget broken windows, nobody loved Rudy Ford and stuff, but some of those communities at the time were like, we'll take the cops here under any pretense. I think, Richard, most people of goodwill... Did I fairly will, say that? Uh, of course you did. Most people of goodwill will opt for, I'd rather be safe and alive. <laughs> as opposed to, and I don't mean to laugh, but, you know, but as opposed to the other option. I, I just want to say this, Richard. Obviously, there has to be some form of stop and frisk. Here's where the, the problem comes in. Here's what I've heard over and over for more than 10 years, is when police just throw you up the wall, throw you up against the wall, and they do not identify themselves. They'll tell you, oh, I identified myself. They're perjuring themselves in a lot of these cases. They need to wear their badges when they're playing clothes and just show people a little bit of respect. But you've got to have stop and frisk because these thugs out there are out of control and you need the element of surprise where cops can roll on you at any second and if you got a gun, you got a problem. But at the same time, I just want to say this because it's very important. They're about to roll out early these special TNT, if you will, type teams of 400 officers. The NYPD got in trouble with this before. It, we own the night. That the same type of units that happened in the Bronx, and that's when Amadou Diallo happened. Yep. The same team, even with a sergeant on hand, and 41 shots were follow, fi fired at Mr. Diallo, and all he had was a wallet. You know, Scott, in terms of historical context, we were looking at some numbers. If we could bring it up here, because uh, I had this debate a couple weeks ago where people were like, oh my God, you know, and I'm like, yeah, compared to what? I remember. You know, and I even was surprised that 90 was the high water point in terms of murders. I mean, you're talking, you know, almost seven to one here in terms of where we were 
where we are now compared to where it was in the battle of days in 1990. And I even remember the 80s, no walk in the park. Try walking around Times Square in the late 70s or whatever else. It's a lot different than today. Do we need to put it in a historical context or do you just get the feeling that things are going in the wrong direction in terms of street safety, et cetera? Well, I think they are going in the wrong direction. And, and I disagree with Andrew on this. The question, you know, what cost? Uh, I don't think there's any question that stop and frisk is the reason, the lack of it, is the reason that you're seeing more gun violence and homicides. Um, why? Because gang members know they can carry the, the weapon. They're not going to be stopped any longer because people who are out there who want to cause crime know that they're not going to be uh, le legitimately pulled aside. And it's not to diminish um, Donna's point, but if you train the officers correctly, okay, and you do it properly, and you identify yourselves, I don't think there's any question that stop and frisk helped that those statistics over the course of those years to bring down violence. And you know what? I think it's really important. I mean, New York City, all across the board, has had the reputation now of being having less crime than Chicago and other large cities. And I think we're in for real trouble unless we start to come back to the stop and frisk, maybe not quite the same way, but I think it's critical but, to but start. But you just hit that point about not to the same point. This is what I never understood. At one point, we know, you know, PD's got quotas. You got to do a certain amount of arrests, a certain number of stops, you got to do the fine. They can't do that anymore. Maybe they should never have done it in the first place. Uh, but what I'm saying is, how do you, now you're a patrolman, right? Uh, just think about the impossible position this guy's in, where we want you to police the streets more. Don't do it like you did it before. Um, show the proper respect and the proper training. And yeah, we're in the aftermath of what happened to Ramos and Louis, uh, Liang and, and the rest. I, I just, either you have the policy or you don't. Um, but how, we're trying to get these guys to contort into an application that I think is so hard to navigate. Yeah, but you know what, Bratton was one of the ones who's, who established this under Giuliani. This is not, this is not new, it's not a new strategy. And he promised to tone it down during the campaign. And, you, and, and yet it was eliminated by the mayor. It's got to come back in, whatever, in some form or fashion. And I agree with Andrew. I think the problem in Baltimore is slightly different. But I'm not sure in New York City that the same kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know, that there's just less enthusiasm on behalf of the, of the police. I'll, I'll give you the last word. I'm, I'm gonna, just saying, uh, look, it's a police tactic, and it might be an, uh, an important one. But how about having probable cause? The same way that you would want, Scott, if a cop was going to pull you over and put you up on a wall and pat you down. Or having you know, uh, at least a little bit of politeness so that you can have that stop with dignity, Rich, the same way that you would want if you were the one being stopped or patted down. And how about having it not just be one minority group in a neighborhood that seems to be targeted 90 plus percent of the time, the same way that you would want, Dom. Because like if 90 you were the percent one of the stuff no, happens I, in those I, I, I understand that. I understand that. But, I mean, but I go back to probable cause as well. I mean, you can't just stop everybody who's walking down Fifth Avenue look, when you and go say, through, we got to search you. When you go through uh, any airport right now, you're picked up you could be picked up by anybody, and it's, it's, they will frisk but you or do what they have to do. But there's a reason for that, and there's a difference between living in an airplane for three hours and living in New York City. But the question, Andrew, is how many deaths do we need before we start stop and frisk again to stop gun violence? I mean, that's really a question. You've got already this year, you've got that many. How many more deaths until you actually put in a policy that can start to prevent it? If the facts seem to indicate that that policy worked in preventing it. Mm. Uh, and, and here is the rub. You know, and, and it gets driven off of a tragedy. Um, and math be damned, like you said, you can show definitively guys look like him more than look like us that are getting pulled over and stopped. And especially if you live in the wrong zip code, it's going to happen more to you. Is that fair? No. But then you're taking the violence. So this is going to be, trust me, a debate that's going to go on at least for this entire summer, I have a feeling. All right, coming up next, politics. Lindsey Graham, he's running for president. But what was interesting was what he had to say in his announcement and what he has to say about the role of government that puts him at odds with many in his own party.